Amen. Thank you, Lindsay, for that, and uh, everyone for the music this morning. We appreciate it. Well, if you brought your Bibles with you, turn to Isaiah chapter 7. Our passage this morning is going to be in Isaiah chapter 7, and we'll be looking in particular at verse 14, although when I read in just a second, we'll read 10 through 14, but Isaiah chapter 7 in verse 14, and the title of the message this morning is The Sign of Emmanuel. So Isaiah seven fourteen, The Sign of Emmanuel is the title of the message. Now, sometimes the Lord asks us to trust Him to bring about His promises, even though sometimes they seem impossible from our standpoint. I thought of one example of that would be Joshua. Joshua was told, was told to overthrow a city with only trumpets and shouting. That seems quite amazing, doesn't it? He was told to trust the Lord. The Lord would bring about His promises in a very unusual way, but in a way that we might seem seems impossible. On this Christmas morning, we're going to look at a familiar passage, and the passage is going to remind both us, but also in particular, in history, King Ahaz, that he was with him, the Lord was, that is, and that he only needed to trust him to fulfill and to bring about his promises that he had revealed in his word. And so it also looks down, if you will, the corridor time, it looks to the future where God will be with his people in a very unique and special way. So in the original setting of the passage in Isaiah, King Ahaz is going to be told to trust God, to bring about his promises, that God was with him even in an impossible situation. But then, of course, it looks far into the future, hundreds of years later, where a Messiah, a figure will be born and he will be with his people in a very special way. And so this morning, the outline, and this is on the bulletin, if you have it, what we'll be doing is first we'll look at the sign of Emmanuel. That's in Isaiah 7, 14. Again, I'm going to read verses 10 through 14, but we're going to zero in on verse 14. Then after we look at it historically, what was it saying and looking to the future as well, we'll look at the New Testament fulfillment of this. And then last, third, what is the significance of Emmanuel? In other words, so what? What does it mean for individuals when the fulfillment came up through today? And the reason why I have this at the very ending is it's good for us to know intellectually in our heads what is meant by the sign of Emmanuel. And it's, we need to know that it was fulfilled and how the Lord fulfilled it. But there's also, if you will, the application to it, which is, what is the significance to it? What does the meaning mean to us individually? And we'll see that in a moment. So let's read Isaiah chapter 7 again. We're going to zero in on verse 14, but I'm going to read verses 10 through 14 to help us get the historical background a little bit better. So follow along with me. Isaiah 7, we'll read verses 10 through 14. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz and saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight of a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, before we look at verse 14, it's helpful to get a little bit of what is the setting of this, so you can have a better idea of what it meant at the time, but also, of course, what it means in the future, if you will. So, Isaiah 7:14. One of the things to remember, of course, is that particular verse, verse 14, is speaking of a prophecy that will take place hundreds of years later. And if you date the book of Isaiah the way that I do, you're looking at about 700 years before the fulfillment actually comes. So hundreds of years before the fulfillment that we'll look at in a little bit in the New Testament, Isaiah is giving a, if you will, word of the Lord, a prophecy 
uh, concerning something that is both present in terms of what it would have meant to King Ahaz, but it also looks forward to its ultimate fulfillment. Now, in order to understand this, and we won't read 2 Kings 16 or 2 Chronicles 28, but I would encourage you sometime to take some time to read those two. 2 Kings chapter 16 and 2 Chronicles 28. They give you the actual background, the historical information of what was going on during that particular time when Isaiah is prophesying. In short, what you have is you have the king of Israel and Aram, A -A -A, excuse me, A-R-A-M, they are joining together and they want to destroy and overthrow King Ahaz. Now let me stop here for a second because sometimes we get confused. God established, of course, the nation of Israel. And then when the time of Solomon began to end and when it ended, you end up with the divided kingdom. You have Israel, uh, well, in other words, and then you also have Judah. You have the divided kingdom. And the divided kingdom runs throughout the time post-King Solomon. And so the king of Israel has formed a, if you will, coalition with Aram. And he plans to attack Judah, which is what, of course, the king of Judah was King Ahaz. And they want to join and attack him and overthrow him so that they can make an attack on the Assyrians. The prophet Isaiah, though, goes to King Ahaz, and you can read about this, like I said, 2 Kings 16, 2 Chronicles 28, and he tell, tells King Ahaz to trust God, and the way by which he would trust God is to say to God, God, give me a sign that you will be with me. Give me a sign that you will fulfill your promises. Give me a sign, in other words, that, of course, I don't need to trust in anything else but you. Ahaz refuses. Now, there's two reasons for this. One is that he has already sought an alliance with the Assyrians. Two, he doesn't trust God. He sought an alliance outside of God. And so to understand the prophecy and what it meant then versus what it means to us today, and in other words, in the future, we need to remember that King Ahaz is on the back foot. He's getting ready to be overthrown. And the prophet Isaiah says to him, go before the Lord, ask God to give you a sign that he will be with you. He will not ever be done with his Davidic covenant. He will fulfill it. He will fulfill all of his promises of his word, and he will be with you. And Ahaz says, no. I've already sought an alliance with the Assyrians, and so thus I don't need to seek help from the Lord. I've sought help from the Lord. In other words, I've sought help outside of the Lord. Now I want you to stop and think for, your sec for a second on that. So King Ahaz is one of the descendants of King David and Solomon, and he has been told through God's word, that God will fulfill his Davidic covenant. And he has this army, king of the king and the nation of Israel, coming up against him, the king of Israel and Aram. And he says, you know what? Instead of trusting in God, instead of going to God, I'm going to seek help outside of God. And so what you see there is that King Ahaz is much like many of us, isn't he? Today, where we don't trust God fully and we don't trust God fully to fulfill his promises, do we? And so we seek help outside of, of course, the Lord. The Lord promises throughout his word to be with his people. He will bring about his promises. And what does he ask his people to do? Trust. Trust and obey. There is no other way. Psalm 20 Verse 7 says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. So right off, what we need to understand is that King Ahaz does not trust that God will be with him. He doesn't trust that God will fulfill all of his promises, and he sought help outside of the Lord. Now, how often do you and I fall into that category? where we seek trust and help outside of the Word of God, outside of the Lord, we seek help somewhere else. But the Lord promises to His people that He will fulfill His Word in His time, and He can be trusted. 
Now, when we get to, of course, the actual prophecy itself, you will see where in verse 14, now I think that the long understanding of Emmanuel has more meaning to it when we understand why it was originally given and what it ultimately sees its fulfillment as. So what you see in verse 14 is having already given the, if you will, instruction in verse 13, that the instruction is given initially to the nation or the rather the house of David. God has promised David and the lineage and the offspring of David that one day there will be a ruler who will come and the ruler will be different than all rulers that precede it. He will be holy. He will be righteous. He will fulfill all of the Lord's promises. And when he comes, his kingdom will have no end. And so one of the things that God is saying here to Ahaz is that I am good on my promise. David's dynasty will be fulfilled, even though you have all of this going against you. All of this opposition is coming up against you. And so you notice in verse 13, it says, Listen, O house of David, is anything impossible for God? And I ask you that question. Do you think there's anything too impossible for God? Can God protect his promises? Of course, but he calls on us to trust him. And so the house of David, which King Ahaz represented, was basically God's promise that David's dynasty would continue and remain, no matter what was going on, no matter what the opposition was. I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings. If you brought your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. I'm going to read two verses for you here, just to sort of drive this point home. I think it's unfortunate, without looking at the, back, the background historically on it, we, we miss sort of the thrust of the passage. And the thrust of the passage is this, God one day is going to fulfill His Davidic covenant promise, and there's not anything that will ever come up against that that would, of course, negate it, where God would not be able to fulfill it. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 8, this is when the ark is being brought into the temple, and we have a prayer of dedication by King Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 25, Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep your servant David, my father, that you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your sons take heed to their way to walk before me as you have walked. And so basically the promise is, is set forth on obedience. They need to be obedient to what God has said, regardless of external circumstances, and God will be faithful to that promise. God is faithful, and he, you can trust Him to bring about the promises of His Word. God says there will be one day the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, and Ahaz, all you have to do is trust me. There may be this massive army coming against you. There may be all odds, everything against you. But you just simply need to trust that I will be with you. Now look over in 1 Kings 8 verse 56. This is, of course, the ending of that beautiful prayer of dedication and is Solomon's benediction. And Solomon says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. But notice, not one word has failed of all of his good promise which he promised through Moses, his servant. So what I want you to see here is that God is faithful. He will bring about the promises of his word. All we are called to do is trust that he will do even what seems to be impossible from our standpoint. Now, let's go back to our verse in Isaiah 7, 14. Having given this promise, reminding Ahaz to remember the promise given to the house of David. In verse 14, the prophet says, Therefore the Lord himself, so God is the one who is giving a sign. Even though Ahaz has in a sense said, I'm not seeking the Lord. I'm not going to seek a sign from him. God says, I'm still going to give you one anyway. That would be the vernacular of today. I'm going to give you a particular sign. And of course, you see what the sign is. He says, behold, of course, a virgin will give birth and he will bear to he will bear a son. So the one thing we see right here is of course the idea of a particular virgin. 
the New King James, I think, translates this a little bit more specific. Uh, in the original language, it says, the virgin. It's pointing to a specific virgin in the future that will bring about the promise that is given here. And so there's going to be a virgin somewhere in the future. There's no timetable set on it, and that's really important. There's no timetable. There will be a specific one who comes in the future, and she will give birth to a child. But the child, of course, it narrows down to it will be a male child. And the child's name, you'll notice the significance of it now, is what? God with us. Now stop for a second and think of Ahaz. Ahaz has these two enemies that are coming up against him. He has this massive military that's coming up against him. And instead of trusting that God will be with him, what does he do? He seeks help outside of God. And God, in a sense, rebukes him and says, Just remember, I will be with you. So imagine hearing that the name of this child one day will be God with us. That was the very thing that he had missed out. God is going to fulfill his promises through the Davidic covenant one day. And the name, of course, was to remind Ahaz of God's presence with him then, but all the way through until he fulfilled that promise. It also reminds him to trust him. He was not trusting in the Lord. He was trusting in everything but Him. Now I want you to think today, how often do we do the very same thing? Where we have this impossible situation that comes along, or we have something in the Word of God that we're called to trust in, even though it seems impossible. And we don't do that, do we? We need to be reminded that we can trust God to bring about the promises of His Word. And this one seems amazing, doesn't it? that a female without relations to any male would one day not only give birth, but birth to a male, and then that male would be called Emmanuel. In other words, it would actually be God in the flesh as we would think of it today. It would be God's very presence with His people in a very special way. Now again, remember, this is not just a week or two ahead of time. This is about 700 years before we will see the fulfillment of the promise. But it's a good reminder for us to trust God even when it seems to be, if you will, impossible from our standpoint. So what is being promised here is somewhere in the future, God, of course, through the Davidic covenant, is going to bring forth a male child without the conception in the natural way. It'll be done via a virgin. And this, of course, will be in a unique way and in a unique presence among his people. 700 years some odd before this occurs. Now, how do we know that this was fulfilled in this manner? And how do we know that the New Testament authors saw the passage in the same light? Because you understand today there are many who will say this is just not true. It's too much. It's too miraculous. It's too much of a miracle. How many of us today believe in miracles? Well, in order to believe the Bible, you have to believe in miracles. And this is one of them. Now, I want us to turn to when this was fulfilled and whether or not the New Testament authors saw this as an actual fulfillment or not through the birth of Jesus. So, having described the basics, that King Ahaz was promised that God would not destroy, annihilate the, if you will, promise of the Davidic covenant that God one day would fulfill it and he needed just to trust that God would be with him. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 because again God is not constrained by time in which he fulfills something. God will fulfill something whenever he jolly well pleases. He doesn't ask you and I what our opinions are, when it will be fulfilled. God will fulfill things in His time, in His way. And we just have to, of course, trust this. So some 700 years later, and I'm approximating, obviously, we have a record following the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the offspring primarily of whom David I know it says Abraham, but this was written to a Jewish audience, and the Jewish audience needed to know that the Messiah was birthed, birthed through the Davidic lineage. But here we're going to see the New Testament fulfillment of it, and we're going to actually see where grammatically 
They give no equivocation to the fact that it was born via a virgin. So let's read here in just a moment. This is what we would call the conception and the birth uh, t- text of the Jesus here. Now, if you remember, Matthew tells the story of the birth of Jesus through Joseph's viewpoint primarily, whereas Luke tells it primarily through Mary's. So it's an easy way to distinguish the two, Matthew and Luke. But of course, Joseph, of course, was a righteous man. He was betrothed to Mary. And then all of a sudden in a dream, he finds out something unique is happened to the one through whom he is betrothed to Mary. So let's pick up in verse 20. So Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. But he had considered this, excuse me, but when he had considered this, the he meaning Joseph, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So in the New Testament, what we see here is in Matthew, and you need to remember, Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience. First, he has to show that the Messiah, of course, we know is Jesus, has to come through the lineage of King David. Because he has to one day fulfill the Davidic covenant. That is primarily why the uh, genealogy is so focused on the fulfillment of the Davidic aspect of it. We also saw in verse 20 that Joseph is called a son of David. The focus here is on two things. One, the Davidic covenant, the Davidic lineage of Jesus. But two, you'll notice, which is down in verse 22. If you were a Jew, you would have been thinking to yourself, okay, so that's the case. But you'll notice in Matthew's gospel a phrase that is repeated over and over and over again. And it is very simply this. This occurred to fulfill this in the Old Testament. Why? Because the Israelites would have been demanding, rightfully so, this Messiah had to fulfill every dot and tittle, so to speak. He he could not miss anything. Or he would not be able to be the, if you will, Messiah. So you'll notice in verse 22, he says, All of this taking place, the aforementioned virgin birth, which is mentioned in verse 20, all of this was taking place to fulfill what Isaiah wrote. And you'll notice in verse 23, it's a direct quote there from Isaiah 7, 14. And so the prophesied virgin is Mary. Now, some today will sort of hem and haw on this. But the funny thing is, is that the New Testament author gives you no other interpretation in the Greek other than to mean a virgin. The Hebrew word, meaning back in Isaiah 7, 14, can mean an unmarried woman or a virgin. But you'll notice the way in which Matthew interprets it. He interprets it in the Greek with no equivocation. In other words, he uses a specific word that has no other meaning to it. Why is he doing that? He's doing that to make sure you know that he saw and they did that Jesus was the fulfillment of this promise, this prophecy that was given. And he gives no other way to interpret it than a virgin birth. Why do you think that is the case? I'll tell you why I think it is, because you have people today who want to deny the virgin birth, and in the original Greek, it gives you no other way to interpret it. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit knows the heart of man, and the heart of man is to somehow disprove the Word of God. It is to somehow be a hater of the Word of God. And God here says through Matthew that there is no other way than the virgin birth to interpret this particular fulfillment. And so Jesus, of course, is seen as that fulfillment of the virgin birth. Now, having described it through, if you will, Matthew, of course, describing it through Joseph's viewpoint, how does Luke 
fit this? Does Luke describe this same thing? And I have up there for you Luke 1, 31 through 35. So if someone ever asks you the trivia question, in the four Gospels, what are the two that give the birth account of Jesus? There's only two. It's Matthew and Luke. Mark doesn't. He starts with the ministry of Jesus. John basically blows everything out of the water and says Jesus is God right out the front. Matthew and Luke give us, of course, the birth narrative. And in Luke's case, he tells it primarily from, if you will, Mary's vantage point. So having said all of this, Mary's vantage point should match up with Isaiah and Matthew. Or in other words, Joseph's. Let's pick up and read verses 31 through 35. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. So this, of course, is the angel Gabriel. Gabriel, of course, Joseph's already had his vision. And here we see where Mary's receiving one as well. Verse 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. You notice the emphasis on the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant again. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, that is Israel, forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? Again, the focus is on the Mary being a virgin. Now, some ask, why is that so important? Well, it's important with the fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14, but it's also important because Jesus, of course, can't have the sin nature. He, he needed to have the sinless nature. Why? So that he could pay the propitiation for your sins. And so, again, the emphasis here is on that she brought forth through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 35 the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And that would, of course, be very similar, isn't it, to Matthew's. God would be with us, wouldn't he? He would be brought forth in a unique way. When I read the passage this morning from John, in John 1.14, it says what? And the Word became flesh. God took on flesh through the virgin birth. Isn't it beautiful to see how the Bible all fits together so beautifully if we just take God at His Word? And so through the incarnation, Jesus, of course, was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and was brought forth via the woman, meaning Mary. And so when we come here on Christmas morning, do you understand that we're celebrating a miracle? We're celebrating a miracle. To celebrate Christmas and deny that there was a miracle is to deny the ability to celebrate Christmas. A miracle happened that day, if you will, because the Holy Spirit brought upon the conception. It brought upon the birth. All of it to fulfill what God had promised and showed Ahaz hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Shouldn't that remind you and I that God is faithful and He will bring about the fulfillment of His promises? Do you know in God's Word right now there are still many that wait the second coming and all of those things associated with it? Beloved, when you leave here today, walk away with the absolute, complete assurance that God is going to fulfill them exactly as He has described in His own timetable. We can walk away knowing that God brings about His promises even to the most finite, little, small detail, and details do matter to God, and He brings those promises about. So we see that, but the question is, of course, what is the significance of it? In other words, what I want us to think of is I think sometimes we see it, and this is, of course, theological, uh, is also doctrinally the studying of the virgin birth. But what does it actually mean when it brought forth? So Jesus takes on the form of a man, on the form of a bond servant, and he eventually goes to the cross. What actually happens? What is the significance of it? And I think sometimes we forget the significance of it. We're going to look at three things that I'm focusing in here on God is with his people. Jesus promises to always be with the believers, and we'll see where the Holy Spirit promises to also be with them. And I want us to understand this. This is an isolated passage. <clears throat> 
God promises to be with us, Emmanuel. But what does that look like in the Bible? I want you to turn real quick to a couple of these passages. Genesis 28. Now, how many have had a Christmas message about Jacob's ladder? Well, if you never have, today is the day that it will be fulfilled before you, right? So turn to Genesis 28. Because I want you to see here that this idea of God with His people is not unique but it becomes very unique, very special, in a very intimate way when we get to John chapter 14. Now, in, in Genesis 28, we, of course, have Jacob is sent away. Jacob has his dream. This is Jacob's ladder and the dream and such. But I just want to focus on Genesis 28, verse 15, because God has promised to be with His people but as we'll see in John 14, it's in a very unique way today, okay? So we'll see that. But let's read Genesis 28, verse 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. You talk about a beautiful memory verse. Think about that. God there is promising not only to be with him, to bring about the fulfillment, but I won't leave you. I'll always be with you. I will be there to make sure that I bring about the promises that I have given you. He would be with Jacob until they were turned from the land. And God gives that intimate, if you will, beautiful promise there that he would never leave them or be away from them. Now, of course, now we fast forward to Jesus in Matthew chapter 28. And so I just want you to see that God has promised to be with His people, but one day in that very unique, special way. In Matthew chapter 28, we are, of course, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection in those 40 days, and Jesus gives what we would call the Great Commission in Matthew 28, in verse 28, or excuse me, Matthew 28, verse 20. He has told them to go forth and make disciples of all nations. You are all familiar with that, aren't we? And God has given that commandment through, of course, our Lord, and He gives that great commission. Unfortunately, I think we leave off verse 20. We are to teach them to observe all that Christ has commanded. So there is, of course, the need to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. There is this need for discipleship. There is this need for instruction. But is Jesus going to be with them or not? Notice what he says at the end. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's a promise to always be with the beloved church, isn't it? It's a beautiful promise here that even though they are going to go out... They are going to go out and proclaim the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. Not only will they be going out discipling and so forth, but Jesus says, don't worry, I'll be with you that whole time. I'll be with you to the very end of the age and such. So we see where God has promised to be with his people, even in the Old Testament, Jesus promises that presence. But I want us to look in John 14, because this one is a little bit unique. Turn with me to John 14 and verse 17. So in a sense, if you notice, you have the Father, the Son, and this one is a specific one on the Spirit. I have often made the case that one of the unfortunate things that gets left off in the church is the Spirit of God, meaning the Holy Spirit. But we tend to focus on, in the triune, we focus on the Father and the Son. But we forget that today, in the age, if you will, of the Holy Spirit's coming in a unique way, there is something unique about the Holy Spirit in the age in which you and I believe in. When you and I trust in and believe in the finished work of the cross, we are sealed by the promise of the what? The Holy Spirit in Ephesians. But here Jesus makes this beautiful promise in John 14 to his disciples. There's only 11 left. Judas has betrayed him and he's getting ready to go and to be crucified on the cross. And Jesus constantly reminds the disciples not to worry, not to have hearts that are filled with trouble. And he gives them all of this Beautiful array of promises. But one of those promises is he says, in effect, it's good that I leave you. 
We don't usually think of it that way. But Jesus promises and he says, look, it's good that I leave. Because when I leave, there is going to be the helper, the paraclete that comes and it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be with us in a special way uh, today. Let's read, if you will, John 14 verses, um, I'm going to read verse 16 and 17. But verse 17 is the one that I want you to notice. Jesus here says to the disciples, the eleven that are left, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see Him or know Him. But notice, but you will know Him, because He remains with you and will be with you. When, the, when our Lord Jesus was, of course, crucified, He was ascended to the Father. In Acts chapter 2, what happens? We have, of course, the coming of the Holy Spirit in a unique way. How is the Holy Spirit unique today? It indwells with the believer permanently. It's also our seal and a promise of redemption. And God is with us in a unique way. Do you know if you have trusted in Jesus today, you have the Holy Spirit that indwells with you permanently, forever. God dwells with us in a unique way, doesn't He? And so God has always promised to be with His people. He has promised to be with us as we fulfill the Great Commission. But when you and I trust in the Lord, He, he, he stays with us through the power of the Spirit in a unique way. I think knowing that God is with us should strengthen our faith. It should bring comfort, but remind us that you and I are not alone. And that God will always fulfill His promises. You and I are called to do what? We are called to simply trust Him. Trust His Word, obey His Word, and believe that one day He will bring about those promises that He has. And lo, Jesus is with His church even to the end of the age. We are not abandoned by the Lord. In fact, I actually think it is, in true, it is true that it's good that Jesus went to the Father's right hand. Because you and I have the Holy Spirit that indwells with us permanently forever. Isn't that an amazing gift? All of which comes through what? What we celebrate today which is the birth of the Savior of the world. You understand that that child that is in the manger is the one that hung on the cross as well. And that is the means by which God brings about so many of His promises. And so Isaiah 7, 14 reminds us to trust God, to fulfill His promises, even when they seem impossible, don't they? Sometimes God's Word has promises in them that they just seem impossible from a human standpoint. If you were Joshua, would you try to overthrow a city with the trumpets and shouting? Or would you want the army? Actually, the true answer is shouts and trumpets. Because God was the one who was asking just to trust Him to do what He had said to do. So all of those promises that God promises to be with us in a special way came through the birth of Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you've never believed or trusted in Jesus, perhaps the day is the day of salvation. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that, Lord, in your word you reveal to us, and sometimes you ask us to do things, to trust the promises that you've revealed to us. And Lord, some of those promises sometimes just seem impossible from our standpoint. For King Ahaz, he had all against him, but ultimately he had you with him and all he had to do was trust you and believe the promise that, Lord, in your word you promised to be with the descendants of David and bring about the promises of that Davidic covenant. Father, I pray that we were reminded of the sign of Emmanuel was looking forward to the time in which, Lord, Mary would give birth to a virgin uh, through the Virgin Mary and that she would give birth to Jesus and that Jesus one day would go and pay the penalty for the sins of the world. But Father, I pray that we not just simply have in our head that you fulfilled those promises through Christ, but Lord, that you would be with us in a special way. For those who have received the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we have that permanent indwelling forever that you are with us. Lord, I pray that as we go out this week, Lord, that maybe someone does not know the meaning of Christmas, that Lord, perhaps we would share with them the great news that you are with us 
and that, Lord, that began in a special way at the birth of our Savior Jesus when the Word became flesh. Father, I pray that all that we've done today and said brings honor and glory to you. Through, your Savior, through our Savior Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we close the uh, service. We'll sing in Emmanuel, then.